Well, we are uh, going through our core value series. Um, if, if you haven't been around in the past year, we've been going through the core values that we are as New Life City, that God has given us as a focus for the mission of our church. And we've, um, we, we are a presence-driven church. This church gathers around the presence of God. Uh, we believe God's presence is tangible. We believe that God is real and that he's not abandoned us, but he's actually with us. This is actually in the Bible, if you haven't read it. And so we believe it. Uh, we also believe in the power of prayer. We believe that God hears our prayers. We believe that God speaks to us. We don't believe that God speaks differently than this word, but we believe he speaks to us. We believe that we can hear God and he can hear us and that we can have a communication relationship with him and uh, that our prayers are powerful. We believe in healing prayer. We believe in transformation. We believe that when you get saved and through the Holy Spirit and sanctification and through things like deliverance, that you can actually have not just behavior modification, but you become a new creation. And that old things of your life have just so passed away that now you can live a new life that's filled with his spirit, that's empowered by him, that you don't have to do the things you used to do anymore because Jesus has actually set you free. It's not just a religion, it's an absolute authentic relationship with Jesus and it's available to you. It's something you can walk in. And so we're gonna continue this series on evangelism. Josh did a wonderful job starting it off last week and uh, talking about how uh, evangelism 101, that we can do this, that just like sowing seed uh, and that some seed's gonna fall on good ground, some seed's gonna be choked up by thorns, but we, all we have to do is sow. And, uh, and, and uh, one of the things I love that he said is good things grow. And, uh, and God is good, isn't he? And so I wanna continue on evangelism. I wanna continue on what this means for us and our church. Now we have a, 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 a maybe more of a Western view of what evangelism is and maybe what the Western church slash American church has turned evangelism into. And I wanna kinda talk about how we can change that perception and that concept and how we can become effective in our city now so back in the day, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of like the Billy Graham Crusades or other crusades that were powerful and many came to Jesus and they were so good and I believe that they were anointed and people were called to do them and they were great. But throughout history, we've had those crusades in the American church and in the Western church and there were great revivals that had happened. Um, but even if you look at Billy Graham and his ministry, even uh, the surveys that they did afterwards, about 5% of people who got saved in those crusades are still saved today. So it's, it's not a high retention rate. Now, one, one of the reasons why this happened and, it, and does happen in our American churches is that um, there was a, a moment where, and, not, and, and nothing against Billy Graham Crusades, I love Crusades. I think they're great, I think they're anointed, I think they're needed, I think they're an aspect of the kingdom of God that we can, we can move in. But they're not the only thing, and they're not the thing. But um, sometimes what we, I, I was asked to preach in a, in a church in Brazil on a leadership conference to 600 pastors. I felt like, what, what, what am I gonna say? I've only been a pastor a year and a half as a head, you know, as a head pastor, and I've been an associate pastor for about two years before that, and I was an itinerant minister. But they said, like, what kind of um, uh, uh, leadership things that do you want to say? And so I said, God, what what do you want me to say? I don't, I, you know, I know your word. I, I've read your word, and, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me so clearly. And this is where I say that you can hear the Lord, and as long as it lines up with the word, it's the Lord. And if it doesn't line up with the word, it's not the Lord. It's you, or it's the devil, or it's. You, you need some adjustment in your life. <laughs> and the Lord said so clear to me, he said, Paul, we need more, we need less church leaders and more Christ-like leaders. And it just struck me. You know, because for, for, for decades, the church has, what they've done is they, they, they grew to a place where you need um, as the church grows, as we, we've become a, a spectator sport, people come and they watch and then they go home and we say, we want you to come, we want you to attend, we want you to listen, we want you to raise your hands, which is awesome, I love all these things. And then we want you to go home, we want you to tithe. And then we want you to go home and be good Christians and then do that again. And that's gonna be church. And there's an amazing value in that 
And, and, and I, I love Sunday morning. I mean, I love it. I love, I mean, announcement time, we're all just like chatterboxes, right? It's a great church. You can't get this stuff anywhere, you know, <laughs> as our founding pastor used to say. Like green chilies, can't get them just anywhere. But what happened was, is we, we've taken the church model and we started looking at, hey, we're getting a lot of people coming and discipleship is teetering off. And so what do we do? How do we do this? We, we don't have uh, uh, enough resources. So what, what they did was they looked to the business world and they got a business model, which I love business. Every, any, any of you who've been in business, business is not bad, it's great. But the problem is, is when you apply a business model to a church, you start producing duplicates and not disciples. Duplicates, not disciples. And, you know, so what you do is you have programs, you have seminars, you have conferences. I love all these things. I used to speak at all of them all the time. But they're not the church. They're an aspect of it. And the problem is, is that it's not how Jesus did it. That's the biggest problem. And so how did Jesus teach? See, Jesus, being fully God, fully man, could have picked any model. He didn't have to, you know, like the business, you know, uh, uh, Ford was a great, great businessman. And, and what they used to do is have one mechanic put a whole car together. And it would take forever to produce these T model Fords, forever. And so Ford's like, what we should do is have everyone do one thing, right? And so they created what they called the assembly line. Ford created that model. So you would have these perfect production duplicate models being made. And so if you wanted to be discipled in the church, you had to join the assembly line, kind of go through. And, that's, and there's, there's gonna be aspects of our church that we're, we're gonna have, we have Sunday school and we'll have discipleship classes and those are great. But I want us to get back to evangelism with discipleship. There's no way to skip discipleship without relationship. And, it, and guess what? I can't disciple everybody. So that means that we're gonna have to disciple people together. All right, I'm gonna go th through this so well, so quickly. You guys are gonna be like, wow, that was, that was great. Now, what is church on Sunday? Church on Sunday, if we, if we go by the early church model all the way up through, um, you know, even like 1700s, 1800s, the, the church model is, the church is for Christians. The church is actually for us to worship corporately, to take communion together, to hear the word, and to do ministry. That, that's for the church. Um, at, there was a point where, where, I don't know where it switched, where it was like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna tell my unsaved friends to come to church, which is not bad, and I want my pastor to get them saved. That, that, that ended up being the church model, and so salvation or leading people to Jesus wasn't one-on-one -on -one as much as it now became a corporate thing. And I don't know if you've ever been in a church service where it's like, everyone stand, close your eyes. If this word, if the Holy Spirit's touching you, which is great stuff, and you feel the Holy Spirit, just slip your hand up. Nobody's looking. Don't worry. You know, if you wore a windbreaker, I'm sorry. They're gonna hear you. Right? And, and it's become like this, you know, and all right, now put your hand down. Okay, everyone open your eyes. And then they're like, if you put your hand up, come forward. We wanna pray for you. And, uh, and that's great, except that's not the model Jesus showed us. And so I wanna, talk to a, I wanna talk to the church today, our church, about being people who point people to Jesus. Because when we think about bringing people into salvation on a personal level, it, it can seem frightening. A couple, couple things come to my mind. I don't have all the answers. People are gonna ask me questions. I don't even know what to say. Um, I don't know how to lead someone to Jesus. I forgot the sinner's prayer. I didn't memorize it. It's not in the Bible, by the way. I, uh, I, I, I don't know how to do this in, in, in my own strength. 
Well, I, I just wanna read you this first section of scriptures. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 20, and I want it to encourage you. It says, it says this, it's in uh, the NIV. It's on the screen if you need it. Since then, we know that is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than, what, rather than in what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. And if we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who, who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we re once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation. That God was recon reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Come on. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We are reconcilers. Now, is the church, is the church for people who don't know the Lord yet? Well, yeah, they can, they can come in here and hear the Lord and get saved. We've seen that. Maybe that's been some of your experiences. Apostle Paul talks about Corinthians when, when an outsider, calls him an outsider, an unbeliever, comes to church and talking about talk, speaking in tongues. Don't just speak in tongues and don't interpret because that outsider needs to hear what God is saying. Right, So there is context for that. But what Paul's writing to the second Corinthians is saying we are reconcilers. We are ambassadors of Christ to reconcile people to God. Now that doesn't mean that you are God. It doesn't mean that you need to have all the answers. All you need to do is know how to point. I had a dog when I was a boy, my first dog. I begged my parents for this dog for years. And uh, they, they said, no, no, no. I was the youngest of four children. They never had a dog their whole career as a family. And I was like, uh, you know, eight years old, I want a dog. Nine years old, I want a dog. 10 years old, I want a dog. 11 years old, I was like, I'll do everything. I'll clean up after it. I'll walk it. I promise, Dad, you know. And, and at 12 years old, I got a mutt. <laughs> Mostly a pointer, it was a pointer. And I did nothing that I said I would do. I did it like the first week. And the dog uh, ended up having to be walked by my family, my parents, and cleaned up after him. And, and, um, but what was so amazing about this dog, as undisciplined as the dog was, um, and I found out that in dog training, because we, our new dog, we, we got some dog training, and, and it's so funny, the dog trainer comes to the house, and he doesn't work with the dog, he works with you. <laughs> and he's like, look, we, we, we actually don't train dogs, we train people and teach them how to behave around dogs. And uh, I was like, oh, you should be called people trainers. Um, but but the, what's crazy about this dog, this dog would run out of the house and you know, you'd think it would just take off. Sometimes it would take off, it was so fast. And, um, and then it would stop and it would raise its paw and point because it was a pointer. And it would point at the thing that it, it, was, it was like instinctive in its own like breed, its own behavior. I don't know if you, has you ever seen a pointer before? They're for hunters. Hunters would go and bring them and they would point and, and, and they would actually have different dogs pointing to the same direction so that the hunter could, could triangulate it. And it's like, that dog is not expected to take out the thing that they're hunting. All that dog is expected to do is to point. And honestly, as Christians, as believers in Jesus, all we're expected to do is to point. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to come and correct their bad understanding. All you have to do is point 
to show that there's someone greater than them who loves them, who will listen to them, who will save them, and will get them free. Just point to them. I try to do this as often as I can. You know, it's so tempting to see someone and, 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 and Apostle Paul says not holding their sins against him. Why? Because God's gonna take care of their sins because you can't. So stop trying to fix them before they come to Jesus. Just send them to Jesus. He does all the fixing. The Holy Spirit does all the convicting. The Bible is like a mirror, like, oh wow, I am really dirty. Jesus, forgive me. If you do these things, God will sanctify you. It will happen. I'm not saying that you, you, you know, enable people. Like, like, one of the things we need to do as, um, as believers is go to where unbelievers are. Don't, don't stay huddled in together, but actually be friends with people who don't know Jesus. Go to where they are. Don't go and enable and affirm and you know, help them in their bad lifestyle but go and love on them and point. Go and show them there is a better way. Don't let them influence you. Don't become like them, but, but show them that there is a better way. I had a friend, I was just reading, she's posted that she's come down with some sickness and then for prayer, and her name's Patty Seaman, and uh, just keep her in prayer. But she would have this ministry to the craziest, like I, she would go to, Strip clubs. I mean, that just sounds crazy to me. But she, she wanted to minister to the girls. And she would try to uh, minister to them before or after they go in. And then she became friends with the, uh, one of the managers and was able to, like, behind the scenes, be ministering to girls and brought a lot of these girls to Jesus. And what was crazier, and, and I don't suggest you do this if you, if you struggle in this area, but her husband would come. Now, he wouldn't go inside. I would say that's bad. But he'd be in the parking lot. And you know who he was ministering to? The men. Hey, man, I know you're feeling empty. I know you think that this will satisfy you. But you know, as, I, as well as I do, this will only satisfy you temporarily. But there is somebody who's been after your life. And he'll satisfy you for the rest of your life and in eternity. Now you can only do that when you go to where unbelievers are. Now most of you go to where unbelievers are every day and you know where that is? Work. Not me. I mean maybe, I mean, I had a few questions about some of you but I just leave that to Jesus and I'm just kidding. Now it is hard to talk to people about Jesus at work. One, you know, contextually, sometimes that's not really appropriate. You know, it's like, you know, you're, you're I don't know, you're, you're working on a project and you're like, let me, let me talk to you about Jesus. And they're like, what? It's out of, it comes from nowhere. Um, and then, and then some, some, some of your jobs have restrictions, you know, like this, you know, especially if there's a power dynamic, you know, you're, talk, you're a boss talking to an employee and, and um, maybe they feel like they, they have to listen to you, and so they, they might call HR. You know, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's now all these restrictions and regulations, and, and I don't think you should hide your faith. I think you should be bold and proud about your faith. I think that's un, unquestioned. But you know what's even better? Is when you invite those people you work with to your home, and you have a meal, and in your home, you can talk to them about Jesus as much as you want. See, some people think that there needs to be like this Todd White moment. If you don't know Todd White, like he's this amazing evangelist who like goes up to anybody, anything, anything that moves, and he'll <laughs> he'll like give a prophetic word and pray for healing. And they'll get healed and they'll and they're crying and he gets them saved and they're delivered right there. And it's like this radical thing. He does it every day. And he's like, everyone needs to do this, and I wish everyone did. But the reality is, is that. There is a personality type that I, in my opinion, that does lend itself to do that more often than not. So what do we all do? What about the rest of us? Well, the rest of us, this is what we do. Most people come to Jesus through relationship. 
because Jesus is in you, they see who you are, and then you point to who he is, and then they go, I wanna be, I want part of that. Now, most people today do not know the gospel story. They don't even know the actual gospel of Jesus being born a virgin, uh, fully God, fully man, God sending his son, living a sinless life, dying on the cross for atoning sacrifice for our sins, rising again on the third day, ascending into heaven, pouring out the Holy Spirit. They don't know any of that. They know of a man that they heard about Jesus who does you know, the, you know, the 10 commandments. Like they, some of the things you hear when you ask them, like here, uh, do you know who Jesus is? And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're like, who is he? And hearing their explanation is mind blowing because you're like, oh, they actually have no idea who Jesus is. And then there's this other type of person that you're gonna encounter who knew Jesus in a really broken church or in a really religious atmosphere, and they got so turned off that when you say, do you know Jesus, they're like, yeah, and I don't want him anymore. And the way to minister to them is to love on them and point back to him and tell them that every man you try to follow, every type of religious structure you try to follow will always disappoint you, but Jesus never will. I was at a bookstore the other day, and um, and I was, you know, asking. I was talking about my uh, Ruth, and she's going to go to Australia, and and the guy's like, "Oh, I I went to school in Australia." I was like, "Oh, cool." And uh, he's and and I said, "Oh, what school? Like University of you know Sydney or something? I don't know." And uh, and he said, "Oh, it, well, it wasn't like university or anything. It was um, it was Hillsong." I was like, "Oh, okay." It was like a Hillsong has a school in Sydney. And um, you could tell the way he responded that he no longer associated with that um, and that he, not only that, but just was really hurt by that. And so um, while he's ringing me up, I said, so where are you at right now, man? Like, I know this is a journey. What's, what's going on with your life? And he said, well, you know, I've kind of deconstructed. And, and then he like kind of moved behind this chair. And he's like, you know, I... I, uh, you know, I, I think there's uh, you know, the, the inclusiveness and there's a lot of ways to, to God and I just, I can't think certain ways anymore. And, and he was just like wanting to get out of this conversation really bad. And I just asked like open-ended question, like, hey, where are you at? Where, where's your life with the Lord? He's the one who told me he went to Hillsong. If he didn't believe it was a sin to lie, he should have just lied to me. Um, But, but it, it opened up an opportunity to, to start a conversation. Now, one of the things about what's going on in modernity in a postmodern world is that, uh, especially in, well, just, is that people who are deconstructing, they call it, start saying, well, I just can't follow a God who has eternal consequences. I can't follow God who wouldn't be inclusive or who wouldn't do this or that. And what, what ends up happening is, when, as you listen to them, and that's all I do, when you're ministering to people, just listen. Ask a question and listen. Point to Jesus, very simple. And I just realized, like, the God you serve is you. Because the God you serve has to look like you, sound like you, think like you. It's you. You're actually the one you, you're actually serving yourself. Do you realize that? And if you think you're God, man, it's crazy, right? So there's a ministry that's available to all of us. We don't need to know all the answers, but we just need a point. Jesus says this uh, in John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the reality is, is that when we point to Jesus, we're pointing to the actual doorway to life. And I, I love what my, my friend Vinny says. He says, listen, the world needs shorter sermons and longer dinners. That's what the world needs. Let's like... Let's like stop trying to think we need to prepare a sermon when, when we're about to evangelize someone and say, hey, why don't you just come over to my house? Do you like chicken wings, hot sauce? I don't know, Piz Pizzoli, that Italian. Um, <laughs> e Pizzoli, the Italian 
Italian soup you guys drink, eat? Anyway, so just, just invite them over. Thanks, man. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. You don't need to get on a bullhorn on a corner and tell people they're going to hell. What you need to do is invite your friends, your coworkers, your family, your neighbors over for a meal, share the love of Christ with them, whether that be the gym, just, just start asking God, God, be creative. Tell me where I'm missing it, where people who need you. There's this um, pa amazing pastor in the 1950s and 60s. Um, I think um, his name is uh, Reverend Shoemaker. He was out in uh, New York City. Um, and he wrote a, he, he had a heart for the lost. And he wrote a, uh, kind of like a poem, and it just, Randy Clark, my, my spiritual father, had shared with me this poem, and um, I just think it speaks really well about what we can do as people of God. We are not the ones who save them, Jesus is. We're the ones who love them and show them the door, who point to where Jesus is. So this, this, um, this, ser this uh, poem is called, I Stand by the Door. I, I wanted to see if we could get it on some slides. I'm not sure if we were able to do that. We did, okay. I'm gonna read it, you can read it. You don't have to read it out loud, but I'll read it to you. I stand by the door. I neither go too far in nor stay too far out. The door is the most important door in the world. It is the door through which men walk when they find God. There is no use uh, my going way inside and staying there when so many are still outside and they, as much as I, crave to know where the door is. And all that so many ever find is only the wall where the door ought to be. And they creep along the wall like blind men with outstretched, groping hands, feeling for a door, knowing there must be a door, yet they never find it. So I stand by the door. The most tremendous thing in the world is for men to find that door, the door to God, the most important thing that any man can do is to take hold of one of those blind, groping hands and put them on the latch, the latch that only clicks and opens to the man's own touch. Men die outside the door, as starving beggars die, on cold nights in cruel cities in the dead of winter, die for, what, for want of what is within their grasp. They live on the other side of it, live because they have not found it, Nothing else matters compared to helping them find it and open it and walk in it and find him. So I stand by the door. Go in, great saints, go all the way in. Go way down into the cavernous cellars and way up into the spacious attics. It is a vast, roomy house, this house where God is. Go to the deepest of hidden casements, of withdrawal, of silence, of sainthood. Some must inhabit those inner rooms and know the depths and the heights of God and call outside to the rest of us of how wonderful it is. Sometimes I take a deeper look in. Sometimes I venture in a little further but my place seems closer to, a note, to the opening, so I stand by the door. There is another reason why I stand there. Some people get part way in and become afraid, lest God and the zeal of his house devour them, for God is so very great and asks all of us. And these people feel a cosmic claustrophobia and wanna get out, let me out, they cry, and the people way inside only terrify them more. I think sometimes we're the people way inside. <laughs> We scare people, that's okay. Somebody must be by the door and tell them that they are spoiled for the old life. They have seen too much, one taste of God and nothing but God will ever do anymore. Somebody must be watching for the frightened who seek to sneak out just where they came in and tell them how much better it is inside. The people too far in do not see how near these are to leaving preoccupied with, one, with the wonder of it all. Somebody must watch for those who've entered the door but would like to run away. So for them, too, I stand by the door. I admire the people who go way in, but I wish they would not forget how it was before they got in. Then they would be able to help, 
the people who have not yet even found the door or the people who wanna run away again from God. You can go in too deeply and stay in too long and forget the people outside the door. As for me, I shall take my old accustomed place near enough to God to hear him and know he is there, but not so far from men as to not hear them. And remember, they are there too. Where? Outside the door. Thousands of them, millions of them, today, billions of them, whose hands I am intended to put on the latch so I shall stand by the door and wait for those who seek it. I'd rather be a doorkeeper, so I stand by the door. This is, this is our call. Sometimes we've come in so far and we've stayed so long and we've danced our heads off, which is great, but we forgot that we're supposed to be taking people who are looking for that door, the door of life, who are just, and, and all we need to do is put their hand on the latch. God does the rest. Why don't you stand? I believe we will be a church who specializes in putting hands on the door. This is our call. I love worship. We are never not gonna worship in this house on Sunday morning. We are never not gonna take communion and hear the word and do ministry. That's always gonna happen. But we can't forget about the calling that we have, the core value that we have to put people's hands on the door, to point to Jesus. I believe that Jesus is gonna commission us as New Life City members. If you make this commitment saying, Jesus, I'm willing to be one of those who stand by the door. I actually, this isn't a salvation call, but I just wanna ask, with your eyes open, heads up. Who would wanna say, just by raising your hand, I'll be the one who stands by the door? Now let me tell you as your pastor and as a prophetic utterance, you are all qualified to put their hand on the door. The Holy Spirit's gonna lead you when you don't know what to say. And a lot of times it's to say nothing at all. It's funny how he does that. All right, well Jesus, I thank you for the commissioning on this house to evangelize the city of Albuquerque and every suburb surrounding it by helping people who we know put their hand on the door. God, I know there's not one that's too hard for you. So God, give us the boldness, give us the confidence, give us the anointing and the blessing to share with our coworkers, our friends, our families with the life that's possible for you. Lord, even though the world might be hostile towards us, that's okay. It's worth it by showing people where the door is. Lord, I pray that you would give everyone wisdom and discernment to navigate this time. Lord, as we go into this series even deeper, thank you for the commissioning to put the hand on the door. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you guys. Thank you for being a little later. Ruth's announcement was a little bit later. But if you, if you wanna, if you want prayer, if you need, she was a little long. If you want, if you want prayer or ministry, we'll just invite our ministry team up. We'd love to pray with you. If you're going through anything, uh, we want to pray with you. Just stand with you, uh, healing, anything. So uh, other than that, bless you guys. Have a wonderful week, and we will see you next Sunday.